should act like a PowerPoint, except it, it'll work. Why would it work with this and not um, just, just the Microsoft stuff is pretty buggy, especially on Mac. Um, and especially for large files and a lot of kind of special users. And my computer is getting Where are we at time? Are we at time? We're to be starting in the Okay. Do you want the presenter? Do you want me to try and get the presenter here? If it's possible. Okay. Um, <laughs> about farm scale permaculture. We have three very different speakers. Uh, we're going to start with um, Richard Perkins. Uh, Richard, uh, originally from the southwest of England, is a highly active designer and educator. He's, uh, he's focused on farm scale permaculture across all major climate zones at different times in his life. And he's now developed on, uh, focused on developing Ridgedale permaculture in rural Sweden. Um, it's a working farm centre and, and, and an education centre. Uh, and I can tell you from what I've seen of the presentation beforehand, uh, it's full of stuff going on. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this and hearing what Richard has to say about it. The format for this is we will speak for 20 minutes and then we will um, have questions for 10 minutes. And we'll do that after each speaker. Uh, and um, if you overrun, you get a stop, folks. Sorry. <laughs> Would you like a warning? Five minutes? One minute? Uh, no, I'll go with the screen. OK. Grant. Thank you. Thanks, Grant. OK. And did we work out a solution to the charger? No. No. OK, so the batteries <laughs> might <laughs> cut out at any moment. OK. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for turning up here, and I'm really excited to share what we're up to in Sweden now at our beautiful farm, and just give you a broad overview of farm-scale permaculture through the lens of what we're doing at our little farm in Sweden. Just to give you a bit of context, uh, I went to organic agricultural school in 99, 2000, and left there with more questions than answers, and began looking for uh, practical doable solutions that were soil building and um, working for the benefit of people and local communities. That's led me on a very varied pathway and I completed a diploma in permaculture design here in the UK and went on to uh, study towards a master's at Guy University and left there to set up a design and consulting firm which I ran for many years and we've been doing intensive education around the world as well as uh, property and site developments and we've done about a hundred of those in the Mediterranean, cool and cold temperate climates and the subtropics. Uh, so that's been my focus and uh, more recently we've settled down onto a farm last spring and we're setting up a, 
a pasture and perennial crop-based regenerative agriculture. Um, so we, we use permaculture design as this sort of umbrella for all of our design work, but farm-scale permaculture needs a few additional tools. Um, you're all familiar with the ethics and design principles and biomimicry that goes on within permaculture design, but we use two other parts to our, two other legs to our stool, you could say, and that's key line design, which we use for its topographic geometrical patterning of landscapes reading landscapes and applying uh, optimal patterns within those landscapes, the work of Pierre Yeomans. Um, and it also gives us the scale of permanence, which we use as an organizing pattern for our larger landscape permaculture design. Permaculture, I found, working on a larger landscape has never had a really thorough organizing framework. And this scale of permanence works by starting with the most permanent features in the design and designing in this order for maximum resiliency and energy efficiency, etc. So this is the lens that we do all of our design work through, the order or the pattern of design. We also operate a key line plow. It's a, a sort of Rolls-Royce subsoil plow to lift compaction. And we've also rigged that up as a tree planting machine. And we also work with holistic management. Oh. Holistic management and the work of Alan Savory really gives us the ability to clarify the context within which we make decisions, and we use it for decision making and for financial planning and grazing planning of livestock. Uh, and this is one of the key aspects that we um, see can really expand the permaculture um, toolkit, really, on a larger landscape scale. This really gives us the ability to manage complexity. And as farmers, we're dealing with social complexity, economic complexity, ecosystem complexity. And permaculture, I found, has never had a really clear decision-making matrix. So these are the three main aspects of our design work that we integrate together under the umbrella of farm-scale permaculture. So I come from a little rural village in the southwest of the UK. And now I'm in a, a small rural village in the southwest of Sweden at 59 degrees north. You can see the Arctic Circle is marked here. It's, it's a very harsh climate. Uh, this year we had the coldest, wettest spring for about 80 years. And uh, people would have probably starved in Sweden in the past <coughs> under the same conditions we've had this year. Um, it's a very seasonal farming operation we have. And it's also one of the hardest economies to set up a land-based small rural enterprise in Europe, say perhaps Norway. Uh, it's extremely high taxation, extremely expensive country, and very, very highly regulated. Uh, I never expected to live in a colder, more conservative, <laughs> more expensive country than the UK, uh, but I did. So I searched out for a property, and we had a list of about 55 clear objectives in our property search. It took about a year and a half, and we found a 10-hectare farm that includes some of the forestry up here and these main fields. And we set about designing a uh, pastured meat and perennial crop-based agriculture. And so we run, um, at the moment, we're running meat chickens and uh, egg production. And we've planted thousands of fruit and nut berry bushes and run gardens and things for our own consumption too. And we're working with two main arms to our farm enterprises. The first is that we're trying to make a, a thriving, profitable farm. There's very few examples in Europe of permaculture farms that actually make their income from farming. It's very easy to make income from trainings, consulting, etc. But we want to really show, hey, we can have a good quality of life farming the land responsibly. And then the other arm is that we do a lot of education. I have an established sort of education enterprise that I've seated now at the farm. And we're trying to educate and empower people into action to do this wherever they are in different countries around the world. Um, this is what the farm looks like at summer of the first season last year and we've laid out all of these silver pasture agroforestry lanes on a key line pattern planted about four or five thousand trees established windbreaks <coughs> created kitchen gardens and last year we introduced animals to start recording data and doing survey work to be able to design 
profitable enterprises this year. This is our kitchen gardens. Uh, now, this is this summer. Uh, producing food, we produce another 1,000 square meters of gardens over the road there. And we're already producing complete nutrition vegetable wise for about five families there. But for six months, it looks like this. It's a very seasonal uh, farming opportunity, which works very well. We have very cold and bright, clear skies in the winter. It's very beautiful. And it's also a time for resting and planning for the next year. So we've, we've set this up. We've been working on the ground nine months now, and a, a lot's happened. But we've set this up in the framework. Sorry, my slides are a bit different sizes. Um, we've set this up with pioneering education. We're running internship programs based around yeoman scale of permanence, starting with defining uh, the context within which we're working and looking at holistic management structures. And then we teach people key line design and all the elements that follow in that in order to give people really tangible hands-on experience of how to design these things and then take them out into the field and actually do them. So we really concentrate the first couple of years with this unique educational opportunity to give people a hands-on uh, approach to actually taking design from computers into the field and actually doing it. Because there's very few places we've found where people actually can get tangible hands-on experience setting these systems up from scratch. A lot of people have been introduced to key line design and, and holistic management but have no real way to act upon it. So we created very rich uh, 10 week internship programs that train people in all aspects of what we do and then take it out in the field and they manage those systems too. We're running our last one next year because we're moving towards more of a an, uh, internship uh, program. We want to bring back internships. So our design work starts with the water layer of design. We understand the landscape, we have detailed surveys and topographic maps and in our case, we have high compaction levels in the field due to plough agriculture. And here's Tanya, actually, who's sitting here. And we teach people how to create key line design layouts and then how to implement them on the field. And that's created the backbone of the pattern of the trees you see in these funny patterns around the field. We also work with um, appropriate technologies. We have water from a forest stream running seemingly uphill to feed a header tank to run a ram pump that can feed water around the farm so that we can mimic nature without using lots of oil or electricity or pumps. So we move animals daily in the way that animals evolve to move in nature. So we need to be able to use cheap, effective, innovative ways to get water to animals on the move. So we have a system of quick release pipes all around our farm where we can take reels of uh, air hose and have animals anywhere on our farm <coughs> connected to, to water instantly, very cheaply, very effectively. And that patterning you saw, we, we've adapted our key line plough for farm scale tree planting and laid out silver pasture lanes, a bit like a longitudinal forest garden. This is uh, apple, pear, plum, cherry, hazelnuts and berry fruits, all the wonderful berry fruits we can grow in Scandinavia. And we've put in several thousand production trees throughout our pastures, not really taking up any of the room of the pasture, uh, and we graze our animals in between those. But unlike most farms, we also like to experiment in strange things. We're doing nut trials with hardy uh, chestnuts from uh, different places in the world and walnuts, etc., on a savannah-style layout. So we have the opportunity to do experiments and things that most farms like pressed by economic concerns, wouldn't be able to have the flexibility to do. Uh, this is a, an image of the tree systems we put in during summer last year. And you can see there's already a thriving um, uh, diversity now. We've just been taking the first real fruits of the, the harvest from our tree lanes this year from trees we just planted last spring. And we're very interested in, in woody agriculture in general because there's so many useful byproducts of having perennial plants that are in the ground growing all year through. We've experimented successfully with Jean Pan wood-based compost. We can keep water at 65 degrees Celsius for about 18 months with these piles. We can heat our home with it. We can heat greenhouses with it. This is at another site that I used to live on in Sweden, but we're gonna be creating this as our long-term energy infrastructure. Uh, we also grow a lot of mushrooms. 
We also use woody mulches to support the growth of our perennial plants. And we're experimenting with open source technology like wood gasification to be able to create off-grid electricity on our farm. Uh, this is a uh, uh, wood gasification unit our friends in Poland built that's coming to the farm in a couple of weeks' time. But we really have a goal to be economically viable. So we're very... Um, we do a lot of work with decision-making and financial planning with our interns because these are really the foundations of what makes these projects work. And we're quite serious about this. We're using models pioneered by Joel Sarazen at uh, Polyclase Farm, which have produced pasture boilers for sale locally, which has meant we've had to be quite creative to be able to um, sell these locally. We've had to create our own slaughtering, so we had to research how you actually do that. Sweden is a highly regulated um, a country and very expensive, and we're doing everything on a shoestring <coughs> budget. I should say that this project, the, the purchase of the farm and the installation of all the systems is equivalent in cost to the average house in our country. So it's an extremely low cost project. We have to be very creative. We do that by taking recycled materials and producing premium products that we can sell locally and make the money for. This is why we want to process the birds on farm. We make the money for the work we do, not someone in the middle, which is the big downfall of big agricultural practices. Um, and we take care, we also want to recycle nutrients. So this has just been approved this summer. We've had the head vets in our county uh, saying this is really like an impressive model that they've never seen anything like this before in, in Sweden. It costs a tenth of the next cheapest slaughter in, in uh, our part of the world. And we're able to process all the waste by compost on the farm to close the nutrient cycle and put the waste water back on our tree crops and it's all regulated and approved. We've been able to sell them by developing a currency this year. This is a play on our name, but also on the original Swedish currency. And we've already sold out halfway through the year. We sold all the birds we produced this year. And so we'll be doubling production next year and concentrating on, on farm production a lot more. We also, we've been developing uh, buying clubs, because once you produce things, you then got to sell them. And it's quite hard to... Uh, come out of the blue and make a lot of products and be able to sell them straight away. So we've been working a lot with markets and developing buying clubs so that we can sell a whole load of produce with a like one hour drop off station in the city nearby, um, which saves us a lot of time. That's also happening with our pastured eggs. So we created an egg mobile, it's about a fifth of the cost of buying one of these new. We've built it out of scrap materials. It's actually built out of a, a car trailer. Um, and scrap wood that's damaged by weather, but it's perfectly good. And these are our main two enterprises that we're building as a foundation that we can build out from. So now the chefs in the local town have said, hey, can you do ducks? Can you do pigeons? Well, these are the en energy efficient animals that will allow us, we're using these transition tools that still require a lot of grain inputs, but these create a bench that we can now build out on with much more pasture-based or energy-efficient animals. So it's a process, like farm-scale permaculture needs to work in the modern context in the real world. Like we can't be totally idealistic, we have to build those platforms. But we're quite different from most modern farms in that we produce all of our own needs first, and then we produce a surplus to sell. And when I say our own needs, that's about 10,000 meals that we serve on the farm in the summer. We have about 20 to 30 people there for six months of the year. So we produce our own meat, our own dairy, our own honey, our own vegetables, etc. Um, but we don't focus on production uh, for sale with these things. We're, we're looking after our own needs to reduce our costs. The costs of buying organic food in Sweden are astronomical. Right? So it's, a, it's more profitable to grow our food <coughs> than to, to sell it. As well. But we, we're really focused on serving the best food possible. We serve like a whole farm menu. We're now able to produce pretty much everything except grain. In our second season, after nine months on the ground, we're producing <coughs> extremely high quality food. People often say it's the best sort of eating they've, they've found at a place like this. But Sweden's full of these wild yields as well. At this time of year, we've just picked hundreds of kilos of blueberries from the forest. 
it's been said this year there's 60 million tons of blueberries that won't get harvested in the forest this year. It kind of makes you feel insane for farming when you, when you walk through the forest. There. <laughs> but we get a lot of super high nutrient dense food in this way. And that kind of abundance is, is, is present in Sweden in terms of its waste streams. One of the benefits of a very rich country is that the quality of its waste is extremely good. <laughs> <laughs> we found chainsaws, 800 euro chainsaws thrown away because they needed a new air filter. You know. <laughs> it's amazing. So we've taken tens of thousands of euros of waste timber. This is timber that's been dropped off an industrial pallet and can't be picked up anymore. Uh, and so we take it away to help them out. And we build infrastructure. We build barns for a few hundred euros. We build yurts and all the other infrastructure we need to run animals around in these ways that allow us to restore the pasture. And that same idea of cycling nutrients, cycling energy, we apply to our soils. So we take all of our slaughter waste water and apply that back to our tree lanes as a nutrient. We make compost teas. We teach people all the different methodologies for building topsoil on a farm scale, from biochar to biofertilizers, compost teas, etc. To give people a really hands-on understanding of how they can take back control of uh, fertility, etc. So just to surmise, like the things that I see that are, are crucial to farm scale permaculture and regenerative agriculture is they must be soil building. If we're setting up as a demonstration site, it's, it, it means we put pressure on ourselves. We must show that soil is building. So we do a huge amount of research and we're working with various uh, uh, people to develop um, different pasture recordings. This is all on our website. We publish all the, the things we're, we're measuring at the farm. We see that it must be holistically managed. People have always had organic production, uh, moving animals, and yet we've caused desertification over most of the planet. So we need a different management system. We now have that through Alan Savory's work. Obviously, we mimic ecosystem processes to reduce the inputs and outputs of the farm and do that in a way that doesn't need loads of oil, loads of borrowing of money or high technology to, to run that. And then we can work certified by customers. So we can command equal or higher prices than organic production in our um, country without being certified. And why should we pay to, to produce good food? And we can only do that because we're working locally. So we have an open farm gate policy. People can see and make up their own minds for themselves. So that's the basis of food security and community building, relationships between farmers and producers. And everyone's got to win. If we can create win-win-win situations, then everything's good. So a little plug, we have a website where you can find out more about what we're up to. Uh, we have a very active Facebook page where we just give an insight into daily happenings at the farm so you can see systems evolving. It's a very exciting time to sort of follow this because it's only been, you know, we're halfway through our second season on the ground. There's a lot to come in the future. We're changing our setup completely next year. So we're taking on our first employee and moving towards an apprenticeship scheme where we offer free education in exchange for proper farm work. <laughs> and then we have totally unsorted photo logs on our Picasso site of just all the photos we ever take. They're not sorted, they're just whacked on there so you can have a totally behind the sort of scenes look at what we're up to. So thanks very much. a small request. Is there a volunteer who would mind getting us some more water because um, we're out. <laughs> and the charger. <laughs> Did you find it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, thank you very much. Uh, stunning? Um, when did you actually acquire the farm? Uh, not like November, two Novembers ago, but I was working in Mexico and Asia and I shot there in April yeah. last year. So um, if, if you've never tried to do this stuff, I have to tell you, these guys have achieved an amazing amount in the first year, basically. Um, and um, I particularly would like to appreciate the holistic nature of um, uh, the presentation and the fact that it was on time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because, I'm very concerned about it. 
well, no, because I don't want to cut people short, you know. Um, but it, it's just that um, uh, Richard has spoken about so many of the important aspects of true sustainability. So he spoke about financial sustainability, about having enough people to do the work, about quality of product. Uh, and um, just one quick question from me. Uh, when you talk about the element scale of permanence, soils is at the bottom, but when you talk about yeah. what matters, you put soils at the top. Yeah, I think there's a, a misnomer in, the, in some permaculture literature of like starting at your back door and working outwards. That's mm -hmm. not how we design plants. That's an attitudinal response. Soil is like the easiest, th it's the most malleable element of a farm. It's the easiest thing to destroy, but it is also the easiest thing to build. And we can build soil in any climate. Like we already have strategies, tools, design uh, approaches for every climate on earth that I've ever seen. And we now have the holistic decision-making capacity to actually manage that in a way that we never have before. And yeah, soil is very easy to build. Good, okay. Um, the hosts this morning had a little <coughs> meeting and we made an agreement that a question is no longer than you can breathe out for. So you're uh, breathing out questions, please. <laughs> Uh, grain, you said? Yes. yes we, well, we're a potato country. You know, if you live in Northern Europe, you eat potatoes, not grain. We do eat grain, too, but we grow enough potato for several families already. Uh, we do like to eat wheat. But the production models have to start realistic. Like, I spend a lot of my time <coughs> trying to snap people out of idealism. You've got to be real. If you want to make a farm, make a living, it's bloody hard work. That's the basic <laughs> tenet. There is no free lunch. There is not food dropping off trees at you, you have to work hard. If you want a productive farm, you work hard. This is the reality. But you've got to be realistic. People eat chicken, they eat eggs every day in Sweden. So we make a platform and then we already design how to get out of that. But you can't just start with pasture run heirloom chickens. Show me a business model. Nobody can do that, you know. So we can't be idealistic. But already now, as I said, the, the restaurants are saying, hey, can you do duck? Sure. Can you do pigeon? Can you do rabbit? Well, hey, these are the energy efficient animals that will just zip us out of there. So we already plan within three, four years, we won't have grain fed animals at all. You know, you can have pasture pigs, etc. Awesome. Gentleman on there. Yeah, hi, thank you. My question is related to uh, the last one. You talked about your chicken operation, you modeled on the Saladin pasture mm -hmm. model. Um, are your chickens mostly grain fed or we are hens. Our hens, we do a lot of invertebrate pasture studies. The hens take 40% of the diet from the pasture in the summer. Obviously, in the winter, there's not a lot of fresh stuff, but we use root vegetables for them to, to feed on. But yeah, the majority is uh, organic wheat and oats from a farmer just down the road from us. And we kind of prioritize supporting him because as soon as he goes, there are no organic small scale grain producers, too. So it's all about context. We're very clear about our, our concept, what we're doing, and we're not extreme idealists. That's not real way to go about farming, I think. But uh, um, one more point is the yeah the broilers are much more grain dependent for sure. They take maybe ten. I saw so a very interesting system in Cyprus last month, which is all designed around trying to increase the invertebrate population because uh, chickens are normally tropical forest beasts, mm. and they in <coughs> the wild habitat they get most of their nutrition from eating bugs. And so it's built, but you have to build that over time. Uh, gentleman at the back was, had his hand up earlier. Okay. Uh, I was just gonna ask if you could speak more to how you get the water to them in the winter. I had a small duck uh, operation. I want to scale it up, but some water in winter is more than anything else. Yeah, well we have, um, the animals have in and out uh, access by law all through the winter. So it's much easier to deal with water close to the home like this, and we just do it manually at the moment. It's, you know, it's not so much work for me. Um, no, okay. we don't have any really fancy, the ramp pump will run many months into minus 15 or something, but, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, how do you measure in and recording your soil building? Uh, that's a big question we can talk about after tonight. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, there's, there's more bits than we can fit in here. Gentleman with the beard here. 
Uh, your design, um, with regards to top, you're talking about uh, potential markets for alternative forms of property. <coughs> How will that affect uh, the way you will need to modify your design in order to meet those animals' needs? That we will see over time. We, we're going to work to what customers want. So we're, we're interviewing our customers, saying, hey, what do you want? We can produce whatever. You tell us what you want. And um, now we have an approved slaughtery, we can produce you know, any small animal smaller than a sheep, we can run on farm. So we'll develop whatever is appropriate. Probably pheasants, pigeons, rabbits, ducks, geese, turkeys, that sort of stuff. It's going to be a cackle of a, a mix, <laughs> probably. Uh, gentleman over here, next to the other gentleman there, his hand up. No? Okay. Gentleman down here on the front. Yes, um, you mentioned how expensive the organic food was as a yeah. just a purchase in Sweden. Was that one of the Driving factors in Sweden, actually, with such a no. market. No, I could afford to buy a farm in Sweden. Uh, we started with twenty thousand euros a year ago, and you know, a farm costs less than a garage around here. <laughs> <laughs> but the, everything else is really expensive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you talk more? About, can you talk more about your tree crops and other plantings? How those are going to factor in? Harvesting by hand, we we've got. I mean, it's small scale in that sense. You know, there's a few hundred fruit trees, a lot of tea berry production, thousands of cane fruit production, but small enough scale that we'll do that probably by hand because we have a lot of people, uh, so we can do that, and we'll make high value value added products with that probably. Uh, but it's relatively small element of it due to the scale of, of that. Uh, 20,000 euros, euros. Um, how much more you had, had you put into it? Uh, in total, buying the farm, doing it, about 200,000 euros. Mm. But we've done a lot with recycled waste. How, how did you yeah. get that? I mean, people here mortgage things, don't they? Education and consultancy. Right. Were you, were your windrows all over your place? Did you no. Know we put them in, we put in about nine, ten metre wide windbreak on our southern border that's going to take a while to get effective. Yeah, so it's still quite young. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I Sorry, we're, just, we're running out of time. So yeah. There's a lady here and then the lady over there and then we're done. Do you have a question? No? No, no. You put your hand up before. Okay, so I'll ask a question. Good. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering about the interns that you work with. Do yeah. they come from the schools or what's their background? Uh, we're finding they're mostly not from Sweden, they're from all over the world, mostly American, Canadian, Australian, European, and um, people are wanting practice. A lot of people have been exposed to short training. Most people are doing short training, it's more lucrative, <coughs> and nobody gets how that actually do. So we're really here to answer all the things that we've seen as shortfalls in, in what we're seeing around the world. Yeah. But Thanks. just individuals, private individuals that are excited to do these things. Thanks very much, folks. So that's all we've got time for this morning. Thank you very much. sharing um, the platform with Martin Large from the Biodynamic Land Trust, but he couldn't come today, and you'll understand why in a moment. <laughs> I might explain it to you. So, um, uh, so I've changed the talk a little bit, but I've, uh, the title of the talk is to talk about community, uh, community farm buyouts, which I think answers some of the questions that came up before in Richard's talk as to how on earth do you get a farm if you want to uh, become a permaculture <coughs> Farms, uh, farm, do farm scale permaculture. Um, I am personally a horticulturalist and I have a very small uh, permaculture designed 
farm in Essex, North Essex, on, uh, so I'm on four acres of grade one land, and uh, we did manage to buy that 15 years ago. And um, we supply um, high quality, high, high end, high value produce into London. So I retail into the Stoke Newington, the Grain Communities uh, Farmers Market every Saturday. So I was there last Saturday. I was there this morning, dropping off a wholesale order for their thousand box scheme that they do, uh, which 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 made me late. Um, uh, talk about multitasking. <laughs> Um, so I was grading plums at uh, half half eight uh, <laughs> in a cold store in Stoke Newington, and then got here to do this. Can you just remind me something? Yeah. A lot of people here in Los Angeles speak your Okay, shall I slow yeah, down? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. So, um, so I am already a small scale food producer using permaculture here in the UK, and uh, but I'm not here to talk about that, which I'm dying to after hearing Richard's talk, but I, I won't too much. Um, I started out uh, in, at, uh, at Dartington, actually, in, in, south, in, the, in Devon, South Devon, um, where I designed a 10-acre market garden that now is run as School Farm. Some of you might have come across that. It's quite well known now. And then the farm in Essex was our second farm. And about 18 months ago, Martin Large came to us and asked if we would like to put in a proposal for a third, to develop a third farm, that the Biodynamic Land Trust was buying again in Dartington. It's called Hudson's Cross Farm. So what I wanted to talk about was a little bit about our journey uh, in partnership with the Biodynamic Land Trust to buy this farm and the design work that we've done for it. Hopefully, in, in, you know, in another few years, I can have all these lovely pictures that Richard's got of the new farm because what we'll be doing is actually quite similar. Um, so <laughs> uh, it'd be great to, to, to share... Uh, notes about that. Um, so the, on the site in Essex we grow uh, fruit and glasshouse crops, it's very high value, it's, all, it's registered organic. I use the permaculture design uh, um, for, uh, and principles to run, to run the farm. We also use biodynamic uh, preparations on the soil because I, I believe that it improves soil quality tremendously. And as Richard said, um, if you get the soil, my, my feeling is that if you get the soil right at the beginning, then everything else follows on from that. But it's really important to get your soils right at the beginning. So I use the biodynamic principles alongside the permaculture design principles to create really good soils. And after 15 years of practice on our site in Essex, the soil is absolutely extraordinary. And so it's going to be a little bit sad to leave and start again, but also very exciting. So alongside the small-scale farming, we also do the training. We run a PDC, again, like Richard, over a year, a period of a year, so people can see the actual practical farming year round as well. And we also do a lot of well-being work. So my husband is a psychotherapist, and he is a family and child psychotherapist, so we do a lot of work on the farm with children and with families in that context. And I think... Perhaps you all know that um, psych psychotherapy and ecotherapy type work done in a nice environment is more effective, and that's what we find. So we do a huge amount of work with school children and, and small uh, small one-on-one -on -one work with families and individuals and workshops as well. So that builds our income stream, especially in the winter. Um, I'm also a mother, which is a very important role uh, for me, so I'm uh, exceptionally busy. They both went back to school this morning, so it was, yeah, out the door with piles of fruit, kids to school, conference in London. Yeah. <laughs> what a day. Um, um, so what I wanted to talk about is, is uh, now put myself in a little bit of context, is, is why we're doing this. So this is the why, the what and the how community farm buyouts. So, um, there you go. So why do we need farm buyouts, community farm buyouts? Well, obviously, as we mentioned before, we need access to farms. And farms in this country are extraordinarily expensive. So the farm, the 13 hectares that's just been bought, or in the process of being bought probably today or tomorrow, um, is costing um, £225,000. So on average, the price of a hectare or an acre of land in this country is somewhere between seven and ten thousand pounds, and the price is going up because people are investing their money in land because the price is going up. 
and um, there is a shortage of land in this country, and, and there is, as we heard this morning, there is going to be a shortage of land in the world. Uh, so there is currently um, a land grab going on across the world, and uh, the, the prices of land is going up, and it's not going to go down. So it's actually not an economically viable option at the moment in this country to buy a piece of land and set yourself up in food production um, the, the economic factors don't really stack up. The amount of money you can earn from doing that uh, against the capital you need to invest to buy the land um, and the price you get and the return you get for food is so marginal that it's very, very difficult to actually do that, especially if you're wanting to use permaculture, biodynamic, agroforestry type methods and um, short supply chains and to involve your community as well. So all of that means that it, it, it becomes very, very difficult. So the Biodynamic Land Trust, um, it buys a farm and then it holds it in trust for sustainable farming in perpetuity. It then finds a farmer or a grower and um, it gives them a long-term lease. It's called Farm Business Tenancy in this country, an FBT. It's projected, protected by law, so it's a very um, secure tenancy. We, we, we're going to have a tenancy for 15 years, which is a it's not really long enough, but it's as long as I will want um, um, to set a farm up and to get some return from it. But for me, as a farmer, partner in this process, it's really important that I know that that tenancy is going to be carried on by somebody else with the same mindset to be carrying on um, farming sustainable, sustainably. So I, I wouldn't really be interested in taking on a tenancy of another farm if I thought in 15 years somebody was going to come and rip it all out and put chemicals back again. It wouldn't be worth all of the effort we're doing at the moment to build the soil quality. Um, so it, it's by, by having a community farmer, a farm buyout, it actually uh, releases the capital to actually set the farm up and to allow people, a huge number of people, to have access, whether it's physical or just cerebral, into that farm. So Martin Large um, set up the Biodynamic, plan, uh, Biodynamic Land Trust, um, I think only two or three years ago, but he, he was one of the key players in the original Fortal Farm buyout, do you remember? Uh, some of you might be familiar with that, but that's the farm that developed the foggage systems, the Hoskins farm, I believe, in Shropshire, and they had to sell the farm because they were short of money, and so what Martin did is he set up a community uh, benefit society and he offered shares out to the community, and uh, I think it was 8,000 shares were bought in a very short period of time, and that farm is now owned in trust. The Biodynamic Land Trust was then set up through endowments, and it's now continuing to buy farms based on that, based on that model. So what, what is a community buyout? Um, so it's a, as I just said, it's a community benefit society, it's a charity, you can buy a share for £100, um, so it can be a share for, uh, for a specific farm, or it can just be a share in the Biodynamic Land Trust. The reason this particular land trust is biodynamic is because the people who invested the endowment, that was their specification. Um, there is also an ecological land trust, and the Soil Association have a land trust as well. So they... They hold the land in trust as common wealth, and Martin's written a book called Common Wealth, and I think it's a lovely repurposing of that world, is, is that it becomes our common wealth, the land that we live around. It might be in our neighbourhood, or it might be people have invested in the farm in Devon from far afield as New Zealand. So it's not just necessarily on your doorstep, sometimes <coughs> it's just somewhere that you love that you would like to somehow have a part of it and hear about it. So far they've bought um, uh, the biodynamic, the BDLT have bought um, 37 acres for Tablehurst Farm, a well-established co-op farm in Sussex, the biodynamic farm. They've helped buy out Rush Farm in Redditch, which is um, which was the where the archers, uh, for the Brits here, the archers uh, is based on Rush Farm, so it's part of our cultural heritage. Um, Huxham's Cross Farm in Dartington is the farm that we've been asked to be the partner uh, farmer for, uh, and it is literally, um, I'll, I've got a map, I'll show you, but it's in Dartington, it's actually next door to Martin Crawford's um, walnut 
orchard, so it's quite a nice spot. Ham they're currently buying Hammond's Farm in Stroud, another 35 acres or 30 hectares, um, right next to their office, which is handy. And they're helping the Biodynamic Sea Co-op buy a farm in Lincolnshire, and they're also buying 51 acres in Orkney to set up a biodynamic dairy. So that's why Martin's not here, he's a bit <laughs> he's rather busy. So it's a small team of six directors, they're highly, highly skilled uh, people. It's been really interesting and fascinating to work with them because I'm, you know, I'm happy to run my own business, or two businesses actually, um, but these guys are really fluent with large sums of money and buying and negotiating rights and how to deal with community engagement and, but also high levels of finance. They, they're very confident with that. Um, so that's what it, how does it happen? So first of all, you form a partnership. The farmer and the land trust need to form a partnership. It's not a, um, we actually had a very formal uh, um, heads of terms document that we used, it was new on me. And in that document, you laid out what we thought was going to happen. And there was quite a lot of negotiation that went on, but it was a formal document. And occasionally, uh, when we all unravel a bit, we refer back to it to remind us what we were doing. And um, then they form a prospectus. So I brought some of these for our first uh, share issue. Um, so a long prospectus and some short prospectuses, setting out the vision of the farm and how much money we're looking for and what we're aiming to do. And Huxham's Cross was particularly challenging because it was a small parcel of Dartington Hall Trust farm that they were selling off. We, although I used to farm down or grow down there, um, I haven't done for 15 years, and um, there was no established farm on that parcel of land and no established community. There was a strong <coughs> biodynamic community and permaculture community down there, but we kind of, it was really starting from um, a very strong visionary place. You know, imagine investing and we could buy this piece of land. Now the piece of land is bought, we're going to have a second share issue and once people feel more confident, I think, that the land is bought and this project can actually happen, the, the, the share offer will be a much easier thing to do. Um, people, um, but so we, we, we ran lots and lots of events and farm walks but, and then people can buy a share um, they don't get any return for it, um, apart from a social and environmental return. Um, people give gifts, they buy them from their grandchildren, they offer in interest-free loans, um, and somehow or other all of this money is woven together to be able to buy a farm. And it seems, it's, it's very much, uh, having watched from the sidelines, it's very much um, a process of confidence building, saying to people, yes, we can do this, if we... If we if we, um, if we believe we can. So Martin uses, um, he quotes Goethe a lot, uh, the, uh, in, in boldness there is genius, I don't know if you know that poem, but it um, gets you into quite a lot of trouble. But <laughs> he's, he's very bold, is Martin. So, <laughs> um, so we formed a partnership, he liked, he liked us, uh, we are the Apricot Centre, that's the name of our training arm of our business. Um, he liked us because he liked the fact that we use everything. As Jonathan Porritt said this morning, we've got a huge um, food crisis coming up in the next 50 years or 20 years. And um, in my book, you, uh, and as Richard said, farming is incredibly, incredibly hard work. And uh, so I use anything I can to, uh, to grow my food in a sustainable way. So I've woven together biodynamic methods, permaculture design, permaculture methods. I use a lot of agroforestry um, based on Martin Wolf's work in pressing fields, uh, who's an old friend of mine. And um, uh, we, we also, um, you know, I, I've got a bit of an academic, I used to be a lecturer, I've got a little bit of an academic background. So they've asked us to do research on the project and, uh, yeah, and, um, we also have this very strong well-being strand, which which was um, which was which they liked. <coughs> so we were invited to be their partner for this particular project in Hudson's Cross, um, and as I said, we've woven together these skills. So we've got a skill set of farming and running a business. The BDLT has the far the skill set of raising money. 
So, so far they've raised £170,000 and they've put some money in from their endowments and we're going to do a second share offer to, to put some buildings on this piece of land because at the moment there is nothing there. So we need a barn and a small training room. There is no house there at all either. So I've just got a few pictures here for you. Um, so we use the permaculture design process um, to actually design the farm. We finished that in May um, to create a farm plan. And we did it, we were invited by the BDLT, they were quite curious to see how we did this, because people often think permaculture is like a herd spiral or something. So we actually walked a group of about 15 people through the design process for the farm, which was quite interesting. And um, they liked it so much that they've invited us to do it for their next farm, Ham 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 uh, the Hammonds Farm in Stroud. So we did the survey before the workshops, we did the analysis and the design process in the workshops with people and showed them how we did it. That's the design, I haven't got time to talk about it, but we are going to do grain in there for our, and we are going to have poultry, so we will try, we're trying to create a completely closed loop system so we grow our own chicken food. I'm a horticulturalist, so we will focus um, on, on vegetable production with agroforestry rows and fruit production uh, with with um, poultry underneath, and then we've got two arable fields where we'll be growing grain, and hopefully beans um, for pulses, dried pulses, to fit in with the transition town Totnes homegrown, um, locally grown food uh, project. So they want to source dried pulses for the within 30 miles of Totnes. This is a map of where it is. So this is um, so this is where it, where it is here. This bit here. So this is 80 metres above sea level, and this is about 30. We've got streams running through it, and this is um, the um, Martin Crawford uh, walnut orchard. Schumacher College is over here somewhere. Dartington Hall was keen to set up uh, a learning campus in and around the estate, and so that's why they were so keen on us being there and having a demonstration type um, research arm to the work as well because it fit in with their idea of a learning campus. Um, community engagements, we've, we found the best way is just to take people on walks, that's what we do, we walk and walk and walk and talk as we go through. We have um, launches and uh, we dig up, we dig holes and look at the soil, we talk to people ad infinitum. Um, we, this is pictures of what the design workshop looked like, we, we, we made huge maps, like you know my scale drawing skills were stretched because we made huge maps on the floor and got plasticine and toys out and did lots of fun work like that and um, this is the soil before it's absolutely awful and I'm on grade one soil in Essex that looks superb and I looked at that and thought oh dear <laughs> so it's already a year uh, I took a, a leap and um, so it looks a bit like that it's very beautiful um, took a bit of a leap um, that's what it looked like before we bought it uh, in April, I paid out for the local contractor to put it down to a very diverse, complex, uh, legume-rich green manure. So even though we weren't tenants, I we put it down to the green manure last April. It's being topped off, and uh, it all already <coughs> looks a lot better. So we're where we're starting, and we'll start on the the deep um, subsoiling uh, in the autumn. So that's me. Thank you very much. Way through the end. Yeah. <laughs> Two aspects there, a little bit about personal life and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> what you've been doing, uh, and then also about the whole thing about funding, land purchase, and so on. So a, a kind of different dimension of the whole story about farm-scale permaculture. Um, questions, folks? <coughs> At the back. I had a photograph to show you. Well, when we bought the site in Essex, there was 500 square metres of glass. It's, a, it's an area renowned for its early horticulture. 
So we inherited this huge, beautiful glass house. So round the edge, I planted peaches. Across the top, I've planted grapes. And uh, underneath, I have a carpet of, uh, of uh, New Zealand spinach that just self-seeds itself and grows like a weed. And then I sell it for lots of money. <laughs> and then through that, we have uh, tomatoes and cucumbers that, that, uh, that we move around. And um, punctuated throughout that, I, I have uh, fennel that I use as a um, functional biodiversity. So that attracts in the predatory insects that control most of our pests and disease. So it, uh, and we put on a huge amount of compost onto the soil every year in there in particular. So we can't, it's, not, it's definitely not a monocrop. So if we grow, when we grow tomatoes, we grow three varieties. We don't just grow one and we muddle them all up. So my understanding of soil science has moved on. And if we <coughs> keep creating a more biodiverse soil, we don't need to worry about this, the monocropping we don't need to worry that I'm planting tomatoes in the same place every year because the, 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 the bacteria and fungi in the soil will combat any build-up of pests and diseases. But if you saw it, you would, you would know it's not a monocrop. <laughs> Thank you. Now we're just with another question. Thank Sorry, you. I can't. I'll talk to you later. Um, earlier on in your presentation, you said there was a shortage of land. There is I, a shortage of land. I don't think there's a shortage of land. There's a, there's a problem of ownership. Yes. And where I live, um, each house has got four acres of land, and that was set up in 1932, it was a land settlement, and that was uh, designed for unemployed miners, by, uh, and they moved them down from Newcastle and settled them in Essex and Suffolk and all over New and Gloucestershire, in these communities, commune, uh, they actually called it uh, colonisation, um, and there was, there's a pack house, and they set up these sort of cooperative areas for market gardening. Each one has got a house, so, you know, a small house. And um, there's, so I think that, <coughs> personally, is an answer to the future. As, you know, the government will buy up pieces of land and then, and then allow people to rent them on a long-term lease. <laughs> However, in the 1930s, land prices were rock bottom, and now they're not, so I can't... I can't I, so that would be a solution, but I, I don't know what the solution is. A good is. conversation yeah. for lunchtime, yeah. that one, <laughs> gentlemen, here with the beer. Absolutely, absolutely. So we, we will be running CSA. Or CSA or being community supported agriculture, agriculture, in case you don't yeah. know. Yeah. <coughs> absolutely. In that case, it was the, the, the CSA group approach the biodynamic farm rather than the farmer approach. They could, the yeah. I think anyone can approach the biodynamic land trust, yeah, or the ecological land trust or the soil association, yeah. Lady over here and then the gentleman on the stem. Yeah. What a, what a bonkers idea to be living in Essex and take on a farm and go. Um, <laughs> um, so we have a partner in the project, so it's all about teamwork as far as I'm concerned. This isn't me doing this, nor Mark, my husband. It's, it's, it requires a team. And so I keep going on and on and on about teamwork. So we have a new partner. So the Eight O'Clock Centre is a CIC, a, a community interest company. And um, so uh, we've got a new director called Bob Mayhew, and he's moving down to Totnes in a few weeks. Where, and he's project manager by uh, profession, and he's spent the last two years working in a CSA vegetable uh, holding. So he will be project managing the initial two years of the project, because of course that's when all the money goes out. We will stay in Essex earning the money to try and pay for it, uh, raise the capital, but also we'll apply for some grant, grant funding. And then we'll move down in two years' time when we're ready to go. Because at the moment, the, this piece of land is so, so dilapidated, there is absolutely no way you could earn a living from it. So it, ne it needs two years of, of soil building, but it needs a barn, we need electricity, we need water, we need a training room. So we've, we've, we've allowed ourselves a two-year period to do that. Last question from the gentleman. Uh, I've, got, I've got a friend over in Northern Ireland who's been some 27 acres at the moment and survived to be a little bit for the bank. Uh -huh. So what would his, his first step be if he wanted to sell it to a landlord? Um, I would 
I would ring up the Biodynamic Land Trust and uh, say, would they be interested in, 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 in buying it? And then what they need is to find a farm. Well, maybe your friend would want to stay on farming it. So, but I'm, I'm emphasising there are three that I know of. There might even be more. Yeah, just give them a call. <laughs> they're very, they're wonderful people. They're amazing. Thank you very much. speaker in this session is, is um, Rafter, who um, hails from the Hudson River Valley in New York, a um, uh, slightly different environment. Um, he spent the last five years living in the flat corn desert of Illinois. Anybody been there? <laughs> um, where, however, it's like Iowa, they, they do key lime plowing, and so there are it's not without hope, folks. <laughs> um, for the past five years, he's been conducting dissertation research, which he, um, he defended last May, uh, it says here. Um, no doubt that will get explained. Um, I, I'm very pleased to welcome Rafter, because research is one of the key aspects of this conference for us. Um, we're very much concerned that, uh, as somebody said when they came round my garden, we're walking out the gate, but does permaculture work? And I think we have just looked at it working. What, what's there to be? Well, I think, I in essence, if we wish to convince the world at large that um, uh, permaculture methods are effective, then it's very important that we have research to back up what we do. So thank you very much, Rafa. So before... Uh, before I begin, um, well, when, I, when, I, when I'm in a teaching situation, teaching permaculture, I generally invite, I authorize students that if we've been sitting for 20 minutes without moving, that they are authorized to interrupt me at any point and demand a one minute dance party. <laughs> I don't think this is necessarily the setting for that, but maybe we could all just stand for a moment where we are and just stretch in place and take a deep breath. <laughs> So I'll be, uh, so I just finished, um, well, well, I'm, I defended my dissertation research this past May, and now I'm in sort of the final sort of lame duck moments of my PhD where I'm working on some revisions, and I'll be, which I'll be submitting this fall and graduating in, uh, in December. And uh, there are three projects within my dissertation, and I'm gonna try and uh, discuss all three of those and sort of briefly talk about two and then focus a little bit more deeply on the one which is more specifically about uh, farm scale permaculture. And uh, um, so we'll, we'll start with uh, the first project which was a review of uh, the permaculture literature from the perspective of agroecology. And I don't know if folks are aware of this but in some ways permaculture has been uh, somewhat isolated from science and scientific research. Um, you know, for the, for the duration of its existence, despite sort of coming, emerging actually initially from an academic project and from people who met in an academic institution, uh, there hasn't been a real rich dialogue between permaculture and the scientific community uh, in the intervening decades. And that has some, that has a sort of variety of consequences. And one is that uh, in certain circles where people are paying a lot of attention and putting a lot of value on scientific research, it's hard for us to uh, establish credibility. And another consequence is that it's hard for us to learn as fast as we need to learn to get feedback um, across multiple sites to figure out what's working and uh, how we can improve our game as we go. 
And I do think that the, uh, that isolation actually that, um, is, I'm very far from the only person working to try and remedy that isolation. I actually think there's a, a really significant groundswell happening uh, all over the world and that that groundswell is actually just starting to sort of break through the, the barrier of, um, of peer review and appear in scientific journals. And so that's something that I'm really delighted to, to see happening and to be a part of. And so this review was published in a agroecology journal uh, last year and um, with the intent of uh, trying to provide a foundation for ongoing permaculture research, especially sort of through the lens of agroecology, which I feel is sort of the closest, um, our closest analog or our closest sibling in the, in the sort of scientific disciplines. And the, uh, the review can, was what's called a systematic review, which it meant that I did a very a sort of specified search protocol. I searched with a certain uh, number of search terms on databases that I identified in a particular, on particular dates, and then took the results from that and did a lot of quantitative analysis of those results. And the reason I did this was in part because of sort of like a geeky fascination with what's been published where by people and who in which disciplines, and partially in order to, as a strategy to actually get through peer review. Because when you're doing a scientific review, you're expected to be citing previous peer reviewed research. And since, uh, since there really, there isn't an abundance of that, we're sort of facing a, li a little bit of a bottleneck and doing this sort of very uh, systematic and rigorous quantitative look at what's been published allowed me to sort of, again, sort of like establish credibility with the reviewers so that I could then go on and do the more familiar sort of thematic review or, or narrative review where I'm talking about the ideas and the principles and the proposals. And the, uh, let's see, up here. So just to sort of synthesize what came out of that process of review, the sort of take home points are one, that there's uh, far more support for uh, the sort of themes and principles and practices that are being advocated for in the permaculture literature. There's far more scientific support for those than I think a lot of permaculturists realize. Uh, it's not being talked about as permaculture, but much of, much of what we're proposing are actually um, ideas and practices that have been extensively researched. Um, that permaculture offer has very distinctive offers to make to agroecology. Uh, in, especially in a few key areas, and one is uh, sort of the pedagogy and curriculum. That's not quite as bright as I was hoping it would be, but the pedagogy and curriculum that we've developed in the context of the permaculture design course and elsewhere, uh, which is a very powerful tool uh, that is, I think, highly complementary to the kinds of um, popular education that happen in the agroecology movement. The way that we pay attention to, uh, to the sort of design process and to spatial configuration or the spatial arrangement of elements and land uses in the landscape. The idea that it's not just how much, uh, how much area a particular land use is taking up, so which land uses and how much space they take up, but actually the particular arrangement in space in the landscape that's gonna drive a lot of the functions of the system, including labor efficiency, as well as a lot of ecological functions. And also the way that we, um, permaculture can uh, potentially sort of expand the view of agroecology into a more sort of whole landscape integration uh, that extends far beyond the field boundaries as permaculture takes as its subject sort of design of sustainable human settlement and certainly has a strong focus on highly productive landscapes but also is looking at the relationship of those landscapes uh, to other aspects of settlement to natural resource management and building and architecture and other kinds of planning. So that's the good news. Um, and there's, uh, there's, there's more than good news. Um, the pro one of the problems that we find is sort of a sloppy extrapolation from first principles and scant evidence, right? So sometimes the way that uh, um, permaculture principles are discussed, there's sort of a, a little magical thinking involved. <laughs> the idea that, okay, well, so we have this sort of ecological principle of edge Right, which is sort of very well understood in the ecological liter literature that where two ecosystems come together, you have um, high levels of, of biodiversity and productivity on those border areas. 
And that's, and that's just, you know, that's fairly well understood and sort of a legitimate place to start thinking about how we design agroecosystems. But we have a weakness uh, in some parts of the literature for then saying, so therefore when we design a garden, if we give it wavy edges, it will be more productive. <laughs> And that does, and there's, there's a lot of reasons why that might not be true. And we tend to uh, underplay complexity and risk. And I think this is especially salient in sort of my interest in permaculture is as a, is um, specifically as sort of a, a sector within the movement to support diversified farming systems in general. And if we oversimplify the process of transitioning to or starting a diversified farming system and make it seem like it's going to be easy or that it will definitely work um, or everything that every particular things that you try will definitely work if you just follow the process or respect the principles then we're not doing as much of a service to that movement as we could be now interestingly uh, for me uh, despite the fact that sort of within this very uh, multi multi-hued multi-threaded lineage that permaculture has within that there's a uh, a history of some folks kind of rejecting any criticism from science as just completely wrongheaded um, or, or sort of too conservative or sort of like, oh, you're just a shill for multinational corporations or anything like, something like that. Uh, and despite that tendency, and despite the fact that this review did contain uh, some criticisms of permaculture, it actually has been pretty well received, uh, including by some people who I think have a reasonably good grasp of the permaculture principles. And so it was exciting, a year after public publication, it was exciting for me to get an email from Holmgren uh, saying that he appreciated what the review was offering to the conversation about permaculture. Thanks. And done. Okay. Um, So project number two um, was uh, looking at, is actually more of a social movement study, looking at uh, participation in permaculture, uh, working on the questions of sort of who's participating, especially in sort of uh, demographic terms, in terms of what are the um, uh, gender and ethnicity and income, uh, as well as geography of who's participating. And this is based on an open web survey from 2012 uh, so it's, and it's you know, only on the web and only in English, right? So it's not a comprehensive study of who's participating in permaculture, but it is a study of a particular slice. And, uh, and the sample I was working with was 731 responses across 44 countries. So it was a very interesting and rich uh, data set to work with. So looking at these socio-demographic factors, as well as looking at uh, how do these uh, demographic factors uh, affect how people define their role within permaculture. So I'm looking at, I'm interested in both sort of inclusivity, like how inclusive is permaculture, and also uh, how equitable is it? How are opportunities and functions distributed within the movement? Five minutes. What's that? Five minutes, good God. <laughs> wow, that was fast. Okay. Um, well, I may just race ahead to farms then. The, so um, the, in 2013-2014, I visited uh, 48 permaculture-identified farm sites in the U.S. Um, this was my Google Maps driving directions from that year. <laughs> I spent about a day at each farm, and uh, it was a very uh, interesting process. It was an amazing process and an adventure that I'm really glad I don't have to do again anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> And at these farms, I was, I was mapping agroecosystems, looking at land use and practice in the land, and also looking at sort of enterprise data in terms of where is income coming from and where is labor going across multiple production and non-production enterprises on the farm. And so in terms of, in terms of land use and practice, we're seeing um, a lot of the things that we would hope to be seeing on permaculture farms of diverse livelihoods and a lot of value adding, as well as uh, multi-species and multi-kingdom polycultures, 
integrated water management strategies across the whole landscape. Um, multiple <coughs> kinds of enterprises like pollination services. Um, and again, this is a, this farm's in California, very expensive uh, water management strategies, as well as a lot of more traditional market gardening techniques and approaches um, as farmers sort of integrate the kind of permaculture whole landscape look and perennial production with <laughs> some, more, some sort of tried and true uh, small diverse farm production uh, traditions. This is a uh, 2,000 acre uh, olive and uh, olive and meat and um, uh, beef and goat farm in California. And one of the things that we're seeing is uh, a lot of perennial production practices across these farms, uh, much higher uptake than you see uh, than you see sort of in the background level of even small and organic farms. And so this is a this is a great way to reach out to the agroforestry community and say, um, hey, permaculture is proving uh, an effective way to increase uptake of these practices that you're advocating for. And in terms of the economic analysis, and here I'm looking specifically at questions about diversification and integration in the farm landscape. And so here we have uh, a few different enterprise types across the bottom, and then I'm looking at the sort of average returns to labor um, divided into two categories, whether that farm is all crops or all animals, or whether they're actually spreading their labor across crop and animal systems, mm. right? And with only one of these did we find a significant difference, and that was for tree crops. And uh, so we found with tree crops, when the labor is shared with animal systems, that you get better returns on the tree crops themselves. You get better return on your investment of labor. So what this suggests is that this is sort of some of the first preliminary evidence that supports this notion that permaculture farmers are using animal production systems to reduce their labor input into other systems. And that's, a, that's I mean, this is, this is just from 36 farms. It's not a huge sample. It's just sort of the beginning of the research process. But it's also this sort of first piece of quantitative data from across site. And I'm pretty psyched about it. <laughs> sure. Um, so the, this is kind of a, looking at the, the farming systems, is a, a way of responding to both permaculture's sort of most vociferous detractors, the people who like to say that all permaculture education prepares you for is to teach permaculture, <laughs> <laughs> and also at the same time to respond to permaculture's most starry-eyed evangelists, right, who may have some of, that, some of that naivete that you were talking about, having to do so much work to counter as we talk about the integration of permaculture into real production scale operations. And say that, okay, actually permaculture is neither a, a magic wand nor a pyramid scheme, right? It's something that <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't dispel the, incredi the, incre the hostile market and policy forces that small farmers have to confront pretty much anywhere in the industrialized world. It doesn't just wish those away, but it does provide uh, multiple forms of support, social and conceptual support for farmers to develop these diversified systems and make them work. So. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you short after, but you know, okay. it, 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 there's clearly so much detail in this research that we could, we wouldn't get through it in an hour. Um, how much of this is available online? Or can you send it to people if they ask? Or what's the situation with? I can, s I can share this presentation with folks. So the first, the review paper is published. The, the survey paper is in review for a journal called Ecology and Society that's open access. Mm -hmm. And the farm, the farm analysis is still being prepared for submission. OK, if you give me your email address, I'll give you a Dropbox address where you can leave it. Oh, you've got it there. OK. Yeah. I've, I've already got this. OK, okay. so if anybody wants this, if they, they give me their email address, I'll invite them to box where these presentations are. Oh, one last question. Uh, yep. Yeah. Just before you do that, um, I, this is our last set of questions here. I've just got a couple of things I want to say afterwards before we all go off to lunch. So first question, please. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm a, an editor on a scientific journal called the Facility. It's a peer-reviewed journal. And we've not ever had uh, a paper uh, in that talk about permaculture. I just want to know why that is. Um, was well, that a request for a paper? 
Give, give me an hour. <laughs> um, You're talking over lunch, apparently. <laughs> the, uh, well, I think that there has been, uh, it's interesting to compare the histories of permaculture and agroecology, which arose around the same time in response to a similar, to the same set of circumstances internationally. And uh, the folks uh, in founders of agroecology opted to stay embedded in institutions and generate data and fight for the resources that flow through those institutions. And uh, Malton and Holmgren uh, opted to say, you know, these, these institutions are just gonna slow us down and we're actually gonna go strictly grassroots. And with uh, you know, the way, the sort of personality of Bill Mollison is such that you know, if he's gonna leave an institution, he's not just gonna leave it, he's gonna burn the bridge yeah. you know, and salt the earth, right? <laughs> and then brag about it for, for, for 30 years. Um, and, and so it's, it's kind of unfortunate because Mollison, you know, the, the terrain has shifted since then. Agroecology has matured as a discipline. Agroforestry. Yeah, FIO has accepted it now. Yeah, True. FIO, as well as Via Campesina, right? So it's I, I should point out my article on the soil should be on the FAO website this morning. Uh, it's a shame they didn't put it up two weeks ago to pre-warn people at a conference. Um, but they were asking for scientific references, and half the scientific references I gave them were off their website. <laughs> find a disparity between the type of data collected by agronomists and the, like, we find we started our research at the farm in this frame set so we could communicate with more conventional folks, but actually the data we need to make decisions effectively mm -hmm. is very different. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we now just collect the data we need to farm better. Mm -hmm. But do you see that the data that you're interested in collecting meshes with agronomy research Sort of parameters and uh, to a certain extent, and but and less so with agronomy than with agroecology, yeah. right? So, you know, agroecology is sort of these this this alternative to agronomy, which is you're you're really only interested in sort of bushels per acre, and it tends to be it doesn't extend beyond the boundaries of the field plot. It's a controlled experimental trial, yeah. right? And agroecology is much more sort of transdisciplinary, and includes a lot of more sophisticated and holistic and integrated methods. Mm -hmm. I mean, agronomy, there's, uh, uh, agronomic methods are extremely powerful for the questions that they're designed to answer, and I don't dismiss them in any way. Um, but the, yeah, they're not always suitable for what we want to know. Um, but there's, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a, a much broader diversity of methods out there for investigating a broader set of questions than, than I was aware before I started this process. There's a lot out there that could be very useful for permaculture. Uh, Raf, you're in, uh, in Cuba. You basically said we need to get our act together and, and look at ways in which we use research to validate um, our practices. That sounds like me. What, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's your sense of how we're going in the, in the two years? Where we, where we got to? Um, well, things are, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say that the issue is resolved. Uh, but I think, I think that there is the sort of, the, what I was describing as the groundswell of research, and actually it's sort of the groundswell of integration in multiple directions of people doing research, you know, kind of going into academia and institutions to do research that specifically addresses permaculture. I see more and more of that happening. I also see more and more of permaculturists on their farms or where, wherever they are integrating a sort of a kind of people's science perspective into what they're doing, what you talked about. You know, we wanted to work with the agronomists, and but now we just sort of we decide on our methods to collect the data that we need, and and I think that uh, so I think that the, the ship has left the port, and um, oh wait, this metaphor doesn't work. But I want to say we all have to get behind and push it, but that. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the the general idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Curious, um, in your quest for funding your research, to what degree do you sense coming up against challenges with like the special interests? Hmm. Um, right. is, that, is that a big challenge in, in that world for you? Uh, it's a big challenge for everybody, actually, even if you're in a pretty conventional 
uh, discipline. Uh, so an interesting fact about my research is that the department that I'm in is about 90% Monsanto research <laughs> and another 5% like BP biofuels research, right? Uh, so I'm part of a, um, a fairly small, robust lunatic fringe <laughs> in that department. Um, and I've, uh, I didn't get any research money, but in terms of sort of my um, sort of stipend and living expenses and tuition, that was, uh, I've been funded for five years through my department and then through an agroecology program in another department. And so I actually haven't faced any real pushback on me doing my research. And also it's sort of, it's edgy enough that in order to fund my field research, I did crowdfunding, right? So that, and I should, it was on the slide, but I should say it out loud every time I talk about that project that I, that my capacity to do that was based on 170 donors um, uh, who, who made that possible. Very quickly. <laughs> so uh, I'm kind of curious. Is, is that do you feel that trending, you know, in a positive direction, or sure. do you do you feel like there's a big need to open up kind of alternative knowledge creation pathways? Yeah. Yes. Outside? Yes. And uh, yes, both. I mean, so <coughs> as as I've been finishing up and on my way out, my advisor uh, got three different projects funded to study multifunctional perennial polyculturals, all to the tune of half a million dollars. And so there is a research farm, an 11 acre research farm going in, in the middle of the Corn Belt, um, <laughs> that I actually don't know of anything like it anywhere else in the world. That's uh, seven treatments um, varying in complexity from corn soy rotation up to a seven species uh, edible native polyculture. Um, each replicated four times, and from each they're gonna be gathering just an amazing array of ecological and sort of economic data. So the winds are shifting, and the USDA is noticing it, like, oh, we're droughts and floods every year. Maybe we should look at perennials, you know? So I do think the winds are shifting. Yeah, can I just, Thank you. Uh, can I just add one thing to that, just very briefly? The, the Organic Research Council, or L Farm in the UK, Martin Wolf's research on agroforestry is, is all around agroforestry polyculture systems, and that's all published in, uh, through through the ORC from the web, and they also run field labs that have um, systems for measuring soil quality uh, using earthworms and uh, that sort of thing. So that's all via the Organic Research Centre, um, ORC or El Farm Research Centre. It's very good. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Just hold on. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rasta, and thank you so much for your humour as well. <laughs> um, a, a very big thank you to all our three speakers who've come up with the topic from very different approaches. Um, I've learned a lot. I hope you have too. Um, just, I want to make a quick straw poll here. Um, could you put your hands up if English is not your first language? Okay. Um, could you put your hand down if you understand everything that's going on? <laughs> so we've got anybody who, in other words, leave your hand up if you're not quite following things. Yeah? Okay. So we, 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 we just need to take that on board, folks, and, and I'll have a word with the organisers. Just about reminding people to speak a little slower and so on. But Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and also, um, do do take notice of the help that was offered as well. So thank you for that feedback. That's that's very helpful. I, I just want to point out to you folks that uh, whilst there's been some comings and goings, there've been a hundred over a hundred people in this room all the time. So thank you.
and he's opening his farm and he's giving a talk on it on the 21st of September. Joel, who's here somewhere, is going to be doing some soils workshops, or he was here, and we've got a holistic management course running in November. So, um, flyers about all of that for anyone who's interested, and please spread the word because we need support to keep it going. Thank you. Lunchtime. That's brilliant, thanks. Super, thanks for doing that. Thank you. For the paper? Yes. Yep, just write it on there, would you? Just pen there. familiar but I'm afraid I meet so many people I don't remember them all. Age shall not weary them. Hi James. <laughs> good. No, good turn out. Uh, how are you? I'm good. Okay, okay, we've got another job. Take it yesterday for the. We, were you in this? Yeah. All oh, right, I, I didn't spot you. Just a Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get the presentation uploaded. Yeah. Um, uh, we've got one yesterday, um, and the guy who changed from being full time to part time. Um, uh, um, came back this morning or last night, so we might have three and a half, in which case we're a goer. And there's a few more people who want to come for a bit of something. But I said I would talk to Lucy yeah. after lunch. Yeah, yeah. Speak to her, tell her about it. yeah, yeah. No, I said I'd speak to Lucy yeah. after lunch, so we'll make a decision then, I think. Yeah, no. It's good to think busy, never been. Yeah, but I'm not here for the convergence. So not me neither. Yeah, there's more space there if you need it, more space. Um, it may well be that they put these things online anyway, but just in case it means I can make sure people...